Chapter 1. Swift, Silent, Deadly. South China Sea, 2020. As the sun began to rise, hues of orange and pink broke the horizon, illuminating the night sky, as two shadowed figures emerged from the crystal blue waters. The figures, initiating their swift exit with rifles raised at a tactical carry, scanned the small beachhead with sharp focus as their eyes zoned in to the dense jungle that lay ahead. At the peak of dawn, the jungle was barely coming to a rise. The local birds awoke from their sleep, chirping while the cicadas buzzed along. As they listened to the noise of the jungle, the two recon marines from the 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion controlled their breath in silence. They crawled within the sand to blend in, scanning for potential roving patrols. One wrong move and all their work would diminish to nothing. The thought always made them cautious, yet excited with each mission that they did. With jagged rocks and fine sand underneath, the aching and exposed position they were in, they had to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. As the leader dropped his dive mask around his neck, his piercing blue eyes shined through the camouflage paint he was wearing. His name was Sergeant Jack Carter. Sergeant Jack Carter had a large, lean build. He stood tall at 5 feet 11 inches and 185 pounds. His strong but enduring physique embodied a warrior spirit, allowing him to complete rigorous physical tasks such as the half-mile underwater swim to the shore he had just completed. Fortunately, the water was clear, with colorful exotic fish and vibrant reefs that were all around him. It brought a serene moment to Sergeant Carter as he swam with the ocean life, before the weight of leading a team to an observation point in the middle of hostile territory brought him back to reality. After a few minutes of scanning, Sergeant Carter saw no enemies in sight. He reached to press down on the button of his throat-mounted microphone, whispering, Echo 4 Sierra, this is Echo 5 Charlie. This is Echo 4 Sierra. Send it. A voice instantly crackled back through his low-profile earpiece. The code word signified that it was Corporal Alec Shake Smith, who was waiting with the rest of the team on an inflatable Zodiac a mile offshore. Corporal Shake Smith was an Iranian-American from Ann Arbor, Michigan, although he spent a lot of time growing up and living in Detroit. Originally a heavy equipment mechanic when he joined the Marines, he then went through the basic reconnaissance course a year after Sergeant Carter did. Echo for Sierra. Area secured. Send the team over. Sergeant Carter radioed in. Roger that, Corporal Shake Smith murmured as silence loomed over again. Sergeant Carter returned the radio to his pack, slowly zipping it up and slinging it onto his back. He used a hand signal from his fellow Marine, Corporal Austin Sheets, to quietly approach the edges of the jungle while trying to remain undetected from any possible threats. Corporal Austin Sheets was a Texas boy, one of the most humorous and laid-back Marines Sergeant Carter had met. His dedication to his team, his professionalism and humility for the job, and his brotherly love is what made Sergeant Carter proud to have him by his side, despite being the new guy on recon coming from being a landing support specialist. Sergeant Carter tried to control his breath and find some comfort, but the thought of being behind enemy lines elevated his senses. He thought with nearly eight years put into the Marine Corps, he was trained to be calm in situations like these, where the success of a mission requires the utmost patience, discipline, and attention to detail. But for some reason, this mission was affecting him differently. As the dawn broke, the crisp morning air was filled with the gentle hum of the small Zodiac boat creeping to the shore, loaded with three more men. As soon as the Zodiac hit the soft sand, the men jumped out, lifted the boat, and hid it in the jungle nestled between where Sergeant Carter and Corporal Sheets were lying. Sergeant Carter got up and made his way to Corporal Smith, while two other team members grabbed their packs and branched out, starting a perimeter of security. The other team members stayed sharp and aware, right beside Corporal Sheets. Took you long enough, Sergeant Carter said jokingly. Sorry, Sarge. The LT couldn't stop talking before we set off, Corporal Smith replied, with a grin that shined brightly amidst his green, brown, and black faceprint. 
Even in the middle of the jungle, Corporal Smith still sported a neat part and a spruce mustache. His Persian swagger never wavered in the face of hardship. The sir wants a sit rep. Corporal Shake Smith handed Sergeant Carter a phone like receiver attached to a cord that connected to a large green radio box stowed in the back of Corporal Smith's assault pack. Mortalis Actual, this is Mortalis One. I pass, Sinatra. I'll copy over, Sergeant Carter said as clearly as he could. This code phrase meant that he was talking with his officer in charge about what phase they were at in the mission, uniting words to represent checkpoints. In this case, Sinatra meant the team was on the beach and they could push ahead. More Talus One, I read you Lima Charlie, carry on out, replied his platoon commander with a firm tone. Roger out, said Sergeant Carter as he handed the phone receiver back to Corporal Smith. Hey bro, you're bleeding, said the voice coming from one of the other men. Sergeant Carter's eyes drifted down to a tear in his pants as he recalled that he had accidentally cut his left shin on some coral while swimming up to the beach. Sergeant Carter had been feeling the sharp pain for a few hours but had forgotten about it amidst being zoned in on the mission. Looking at his blood-coated pants, it dawned on him that if his blood had smeared onto the greenery around them, they would all be left susceptible to being traced by canine patrols. The calm demeanor of the man tending to Sergeant Carter's wound portrayed the serenity under pressure that all Marines have. However, this man was a sailor. More specifically, he was a Navy Special Amphibious Reconnaissance Corps man. His job was to be the medical expert on the recon team, all while being able to shoot, move, and communicate with his recon brothers. To the rest of the Marines, he was Doc. To Sergeant Jack Carter, he was Carlos Ortega. Well, don't be shy, Sergeant Carter replied. Give me a little TLC here. The silver bullet in my front pocket. Dr. Ortega jokingly referred to his rectal thermometer. Can you dig in there and get it for me? After pearly white smiles glared through the camouflage face paint, Doc Ortega reached into the side pouch of his small medical pack, pulling out some topical antibiotics, sterile gauze, and elastic bandaging. He then proceeded to tightly wrap the three-inch bleeding laceration just enough to stop the bleeding but not enough to restrict circulation to Sergeant Carter's toes. Thanks for the TLC, Sergeant Carter said as Doc Ortega finished wrapping his shin. Dude, we aren't even on the target and you got hurt? Doc Ortega continued to tease, reaching into the Zodiac for the remainder of his gear. Don't make Daddy Doc mommy you, he continued. Sergeant Carter could feel the other Marines smiling in silence. He decided to just smile and give him the finger for his hard work and sarcasm. It was a team of four Marines and one Navy doc. Their mission was to infiltrate through the jungle and set up an observation post near the enemy-controlled village. From there, they would hunker in a concealed position overlooking the village while sending information to the main force of the 3rd Marine Division back on base until nightfall. By dusk, they would assist the main assault team coming in by helicopter to recapture the town. It was a classic Marine recon mission, but still a challenge to Sergeant Carter's recon team. Hey V, Sergeant Carter ordered as he grabbed his pack from the small rubber craft and donned his boonie hat. Take point, everyone else. Column formation. Leading the team, Corporal Julian Varela Martinez, affectionately known as V, assumed the vanguard position of the recon sniper. Originally trained as a motor transport mechanic, his outwardly composed and quiet demeanor often lent him an air of intimidation, yet among his peers, he was renowned as the most amiable soul in the entire battalion. In both word and deed, V extended his unwavering care and support to his comrades, whether they were lifelong friends or newly acquainted strangers. Sergeant Carter, recognizing V's unique ability to connect frequently tasked him with easing the transition for newcomers to the recon battalion. These fresh recruits faced the demanding challenges of their new roles, but in Corporal V, they found a mentor who was a veritable subject matter expert in an array of fields, from hydrographic reconnaissance to enduring the trials of prolonged separation from loved ones, making him an invaluable source of guidance and camaraderie. The men hiked into the jungle. If the pre-dawn swim hadn't killed Sergeant Carter, 
then the hike would definitely try. With sandy wet pants weighing him down and the three-inch laceration around his shin, the unforgiving and uneven rocky terrain coupled with the dense vegetation would surely make the five-mile patrol hell on earth. You good with everything, Sergeant? Corporal Smith whispered from behind as the recon team climbed over a small boulder, catching Sergeant Carter as he slipped under the weight of a nearly 110-pound rucksack. Comfortable with the uncomfortable, Sergeant Carter murmured with a grin as he continued along with his Marines. Entering recon in the Marine Corps required a high level of intestinal fortitude, meaning Sergeant Carter was going to have to push through the pain and discomfort in order to navigate the island, jungles, uneven, rocky terrain. Four and a half miles deep into the oppressive thicket, his team, visibly fatigued and breathless, persevered alongside him as they advanced. With an unwavering sense of leadership and an acute awareness of the team's physical limits, Sergeant Carter raised his clenched fist, signaling a much-needed pause. His men, acutely attuned to his signals, halted immediately, their heaving breaths accompanying the sudden stillness of the dense surroundings. With a silent arm and hand signal, he motioned for Corporal Sheikh Smith to come to him. Have the team hold here. I'm going to take a look ahead, Sergeant Carter whispered. While the team settled in to drink water from their hydration pouches, Sergeant Carter dropped his pack, grabbed the binoculars from his bag, and carefully trotted to find concealment at the edge of the clearing so he could observe beyond his position. Jackpot, he whispered to himself. Sergeant Carter couldn't help but break a sly smile. In the clearing were dozens of two- to three-story buildings, constructed of sheet metal and cement, aligned along a road the length of a football field. The town seemed to mainly consist of men, noting few women who were wearing similar digital green camouflage, standing guard on the rooftops and at entry control points along the main roads. Large military trucks moved through the town, carrying supplies to aid what seemed to be a forward operating base for the enemy. Situated between two formidable, foliage-shrouded hills, a dense curtain of trees and undergrowth made navigation a daunting endeavor for anybody to hike through. Thus, it was the perfect spot for Sergeant Carter's recon team. Sergeant Carter stowed his binoculars and headed back to the team. He radioed to his platoon commander that they had made visual contact and were moving into an observation point. After the command replied with an understanding, he took his team up the hillside, careful not to alert any possible roving patrols. Once the team reached the halfway distance to the peak of the hill, they settled into a 360-degree security perimeter. Sergeant Carter had set up shifts for his team to equally observe, report, provide security, and get some rest before the main assault team landed. The team already knew their observation time over the town was limited, and they radioed in as much information as they could regarding the number of possible hostiles, machine gun emplacements, who was coming in or out of the town, and the perfect landing zone for the assault helicopters. While on a resting shift, Doc Ortega pulled from his pack an MRE, Metal Ready to Eat. He glanced in disappointment as he read the title to be Veggie Omelette. Sergeant Carter, Doc Ortega whispered, can we trade? Sergeant Carter took a break from gazing into his setup spotter's scope and studied Doc Ortega's MRE. He then reached into his pack and pulled out a jalapeno patty MRE, one of his favorites. Sorry, Doc, Sergeant Carter dismissed. Come on, Doc Ortega pleaded. Remember that time I paid the tab at the Revolution Gentleman Club? Doc, that was weeks ago. You can't be holding on to that one. Sergeant Carter tried to suppress a smile. Even after I pulled my back, carrying you back to base before a curfew? Doc Ortega teased. Sergeant Carter couldn't help but toss his MRE over to his doc, which was met with a small laugh from Corporal V. Corporal V, Sergeant Carter said. How's that range card going? He asked, hoping to move the conversation away from another one of Doc Ortega's blackout stories. Corporal V, concealed in his ghillie suit, maintained watch over the terrain below using his M110 SASS semi-automatic sniper system. 
As he peered through the rifle scope, he meticulously sketched the town and recorded precise distances to key landmarks within, a process that aided him in compensating for bullet drop and optimizing his role as a sniper. All done, Corporal V stated. Sergeant Carter gently moved over to Corporal V's position and took a look at his card. Looks good. Just remember the wind direction is east, not west, Sergeant Carter mentioned, adding a pat on Corporal V's back. As the sun descended beneath the thick jungle canopy, casting dappled shadows and ushering in hues of twilight, Sergeant Carter and his team remained unwavering in their vigilance, steadfastly upholding their strategic observation point overlooking the enigmatic town. Hey man, isn't your re-enlistment coming up? Where are we doing it? Doc Ortega whispered to Sergeant Carter, trying to pass the time. Wouldn't mind a nice beachside, hopefully. Captain Sladen can do the re-enlistment for me. Sergeant Carter answered. What about after? Doc replied. Hit the local bars hard, liberate the women from their boring lives, and exfil before their husbands know we were there, Sergeant Carter joked. They both smiled, trying to muzzle their laugh as quiet professionals. Of course, that's if I don't want to get out and go back to school, Sergeant Carter added. Ah, come on, man. You know that ain't the place for us, Sarge, Doc Ortega answered. I don't know about you, but I couldn't handle a bunch of lazy college kids telling me how their lives were so much better than ours because their mommy and daddy let them have lifelong debt and a superiority complex. Okay, then what are you doing? You haven't submitted any re-enlistment paperwork? Sergeant Carter asked. Uh, I got friends out there, Doc Ortega smiled. They'll want to hire somebody with what I know and do, he added with an assured wink. After the darkness sunk into the jungle, Sergeant Carter checked his Garmin watch to read 2230. His marines were well-rested, hydrated, fed, and ready for a fight. As bright diamond stars and a pale full moon illuminated the sky, Sergeant Carter ordered his team to get their plate carriers and helmets on. Each of them flipped on and adjusted their PEQ-15 infrared lasers on the barrels of their rifles, giving them the ability to aim with a laser pointer that could only be seen in night vision. Mortalis Actual, this is Mortalis One, standing by for assault, Sergeant Carter whispered over the radio as he flipped down his night vision goggles, illuminating the darkness with a green hue through two narrow tubes. It was time for the attack, and Sergeant Carter waited to hear the roar of helicopters in the distance. However, the radio wasn't transmitting anything from their commander. There was nothing but dead silence. Hey, Smith, did you grab extra batteries for this thing? Sergeant Carter whispered in an irritated tone. I know that it's charged. Maybe the signal is bad here, Corporal Sheikh Smith replied, trying to diffuse the possibility of a scolding after the mission was over. Sergeant Carter was faced with a choice. Maintain his position, ensuring no nearby enemies would be alerted, or move to higher ground to obtain the signal to talk to his platoon commander. At that moment, he could hear voices up the hill, not too far from their location, so he decided to wait. Twenty minutes felt like an eternity as they waited for their platoon commander to answer. There was finally a reply. Stand by, Mortalis One. Sergeant Carter observed the order, telling his men to hold it in place until the assault order. Sergeant Carter, Corporal Smith, Corporal Sheets, Corporal V, and Doc Ortega held in place for over an hour, keeping their eyes peeled for any sign that an assault on the compound was given. With each silent moment, Sergeant Carter grew restless. This right here is why I'm getting out, Doc Ortega cracked softly. Sergeant Carter was getting worried. Were they in the right position? Did they proceed with the assault somewhere else? Was there even an assault happening? Index! Index! The company commander boomed over the radio, signifying that a training exercise had ended. The 22s military VTOL transport are down for maintenance, and the Okinawan government isn't letting us fly past 2300. The training exercise was meant to prove his leadership over a team that was capable of conducting both reconnaissance and a direct action assault within the same mission. For every unit in the Marine Corps, there are training requirements that must be upheld to deploy. Sergeant Carter had worked tirelessly to get approval from higher authorities and planned meticulously to make sure that his recon team would be ready for a deployment to Afghanistan. All he had to do was successfully execute a recon operation and then support an infantry unit in a force-on-force -force training mission with the Japanese Self-Defense Force 
to show that his team was ready. Now that the assault team's MV-22 Osprey transport had broken down, the situation was ultimately out of his hands, leaving him with the bitter taste in his mouth that his window of opportunity had closed. A few weeks later, he was on his way to meet his first sergeant at the 3rd Recon Battalion's headquarters tucked away down the hill from the rest of the base. As he was walking with a fresh haircut and a rain energy drink from the base's convenience store, also known as the Exchange, he strolled past some reservist infantry marines. They were weekend warriors sent to Okinawa, Japan for training operations. The reservists were awed at the sight of Recon Marine Sergeant Jack Carter. Even regular marines knew that the parachute wings and dive helmet pins on his uniform, along with his longer-than-regulation haircut, signaled that he was among the best warriors the Marine Corps had to offer. Yet, Sergeant Carter never felt that his calling as a warrior was met. Yet, this was his chance. He had heard from his platoon commander that they were about to do a tour in Afghanistan. After almost five years in the Marine Corps, he could finally do what he was trained to do. He had seen the videos and the news of what was happening to the country. The Afghan National Army still needed help to push out the Taliban, meaning Sergeant Jack Carter would push his Marines hard to make sure that they were ready to make the world a better place. And as he looked back on the mishap that happened last night, he realized that no matter what, his Marines were ready. Sergeant Jack Carter's first sergeant called him into his office. The first sergeant didn't have the same airborne and dive pins on as Sergeant Carter, because he was an administrative specialist before being assigned as a first sergeant of 3rd Recon Battalion. Thus, he never met the trim physique like everyone else in the battalion. So I got bad news and good news, the first sergeant explained as soon as Sergeant Carter was in front of his desk. What's the bad news first, Sergeant? Sergeant Carter questioned. The first sergeant shook his head. Look, we are drawing down forces in the country of Afghanistan. The war is coming to an end. Sergeant Jack Carter's heart sank, not because he harbored a death wish, but because he possessed an unwavering desire to stand up for what he believed was just and to have the opportunity to defend the greater good. It was this resolute personal ethos that had compelled him to make the life-altering decision to leave behind his promising first year at the University of San Diego and enlist in the Marine Corps. The call to serve and protect to be a part of something larger than himself, had weighed on his conscience and steered him away from the comfortable path of academia toward the demanding and often perilous journey of a Marine, driven by a profound sense of duty and commitment to a cause he held dear. The good news is, you got the paperwork and medical all figured out. Now how do you want your re-enlistment done? The first sergeant said in a cheery mood. Sergeant Jack Carter looked at the papers in front of him. It was his personal military record. As he flipped through the pages, he could see his past five years in front of him in the form of official sounding papers. He could see his meritorious promotion to Lance Corporal after boot camp, his completion of infantry school, the basic reconnaissance course, airborne school, marine combatant dive school, military freefall school, recon team leaders course, and ranger school. Yet, as he flipped to the end, he could see the paperwork for the MARSOC ANS, Marine Special Operations Command Assessment and Selection. At the bottom, he could see the haunting words, complete, not selected. As he looked back on his past accomplishments, he was overwhelmed by a string of memories. Yet, lingering below these thoughts, he was consumed by an ever-growing question. If I could achieve all of this, what else can I do? First Sergeant, I no longer want to enlist, Sergeant Carter solemnly replied as he put down the file. The First Sergeant's cheery mood turned cold. You have no idea what it's like out there in the real world, the First Sergeant continued to explain. Sergeant Jack Carter recognized the weight of his decision. Yet, even in the fear of the unknown, he somehow felt positive and even excited. At twenty-four years old, his plan was that he would use his G.I. Bill and go to college to find something else. With the knowledge that the long and drawn-out global war of terror was ending and his opportunities for fighting for what was right ending in the Marine Corps, he didn't want to waste his mind, body, and spirit ending up like the first sergeant that stood in front of him. In the next few weeks, 
He told his Marines that he was no longer going to be a part of the Marine Corps. It was met with surprise and sorrow at first, but as Sergeant Carter researched more about getting a college degree and going on to the CIA, FBI, USMS, or DEA, the more hopeful he and his Marines felt about the situation. The night before flying home to Camp Pendleton, California, to complete his out-processing, his team had one last bar crawl through American Village in Chatan, Okinawa. It was a solemn but happy night. Doc Carlos Ortega had gotten out a few weeks before, but Sergeant Carter had the privilege of being with Corporal Alec Shake Smith, Corporal Austin Sheets, and Corporal Victor Varela Martinez. Sergeant Carter would forever remember holding his drink up amongst his Marines at a small bar overlooking Araha Beach, with the lights of the nearby hotels, shops, and Ferris wheel on the other side of the cove helping illuminate the night. We're really gonna miss you, Sarge, Corporal Sheets replied with drunken sorrow. Hey, none of that, Sergeant Carter smiled as he patted him on the shoulder. I'm gonna be all right, and I know for a fact that you are all gonna make me proud as I leave. Well, with you gone, it's probably going to be one of 3rd platoon sergeants transferring over to us, Corporal Smith replied. Well, if anything bad happens, you know who to call. Amigos sin razón, Sergeant Carter announced while holding up his aviation gin and fever tree tonic. Familia sin sangre, the rest of them yelled. After a few hours, Sergeant Carter was carried by Corporal Varela through the barracks. He got him up a flight of stairs and down the hall, as Sergeant Carter was fighting to stay coherent after binge drinking all afternoon and into the early morning with his Marines. Corporal V laid him in the bed of Sergeant Carter's now packed up and barren barracks room. There you go, brother. I got you, Corporal V gently spoke as he laid Sergeant Carter down. Y you <clears throat> are a good dude, Sergeant Carter tried to speak, and you were a great sergeant. We are all gonna miss you, Corporal V replied with a laugh. I'm gonna miss you guys. I'll see you later, Sergeant Carter said before nearly passing out. Goodbye, Corporal Victor V. Julian Varela Martinez said with a smile. He went to turn the lights off as Sergeant Jack Carter drifted off to sleep in his now barren barracks room. Sergeant Jack Carter would never see his Marines again. After being handed his DD-214, he was stripped of the old customs, courtesies, traditions, and routines. He was no longer a team leader, nor was he a reconnaissance marine. He was now just Jack Carter. Alec Shake Smith, Austin C. Sheets, and Victor Varela Martinez were all marines that passed away in 2022. They had all served honorably in the same unit as the author, while they weren't in Marine Recon, the author felt that this would be the best way to memorialize who they were and how much they meant to him.